shop for. Hey everybody, welcome back. We're in the shop again this weekend. Robbie's here filming a little bit of this content for us. Dylan is out butchering some hogs actually this weekend, so he's not here. But uh, we got Clay's OBS back together. You guys saw that in the last episode. If you haven't watched that episode, I think it's one of our best videos we've done yet. So go back, check that one out. But it's on the other side now. We're completely assembling that thing, putting the wiring harnesses in it, and getting ready to do the computer calibration stuff over the next few weeks. Before we bring in John Shaver's truck, which you also saw was that patina painted 1960 C10, we've got a couple chassis that we've had over in the storage building that we needed to get assembled and shipped out. Now these aren't trucks that we're building, but we're helping build out rolling chassis to ship to the customers, and they're ultimately gonna put them together themselves. This one here is for a good friend of ours named Brian. Brian and his wife are big into off-road racing. They do a lot of Ultra 4 stuff, they've done Baja stuff, they've probably done some short course stuff, but this is their entry to like, truck autocrossing and road racing. So they're gonna be getting out in 24 and having some fun with us. This chassis is also from No Limit Engineering. You guys know that that's probably one of our favorites that we deal with. It's got some unique options that we've added to it that are kind of noteworthy. So I'd like to show them to you. Uh, and some new things that uh, No Limit Engineering has started to add as an option to their chassis. So we're gonna put this one together today. I don't know if we'll get completely done with it this weekend, but it'll be fun to see it go together. And while you're here, there's another No Limit Engineering chassis over here, and it's quite different. So not that it's different in that it's got like weird options or anything like that, but they're just completely different chassis. So we might just take a minute to kind of go through and just see what the differences are between the chassis. There are pretty different uses of the vehicles. So that's kind of why there's so many different differences in suspensions and steering racks and shocks and all that stuff. So anyways, hope you guys enjoy this one. So starting at the back of these chassis, this one is for a square body, this one's for a 1967 to 72. The other big difference you see is that this one has a live axle, this one has an independent rear suspension, this one's got some kind of weird hydraulic pump on it, this one's got Ride Tech shocks, and this one's got JRI shocks, and that one's got a red rack, that one's got a blue rack, they got different brakes, they got different spindles. Why is that? This is for Capone. You guys remember the light olive 1970 truck that we've worked on for over the past few years? So that truck's got a new owner, I think we've talked about that before, but it was on a stock bed floor chassis, so a chassis that didn't allow the, the frame to go as low to the ground is what these chassis do. And all those trucks that you guys see that we build that are pretty hammered on the ground, all those are what we call raised rail chassis. So they actually allow the, the bottom of the rail to go like three and a half inches off the ground if, if you want it to go that low. So Will, the new guy that owns it, he wanted that truck to go much lower than what it was and did get a different set of wheels. And while we're at it, why not do independent rear suspension? So with a thousand horsepower, there is an opportunity to get more forward bite, you know, get, get more traction, and, and just do some other cool stuff, right? So this that's why this one has independent rear suspension. You can see like the shape of the frame is quite a bit different. No Limit uses a, a C6 rear spindle. So that also gives you the opportunity to use either a C6 or a C7 unit bearing. So you can get independent wheel speed sensors. And then, you know, you can always put front wheel speed sensors. You could do traction control, you could do ABS. So independent rear also gives you a good option for that stuff as well as any kind of brake package you could ever buy for a Corvette. So we chose uh, Willwood brakes, but you could always buy like junkyard brakes and put them on these spindles if you wanted to. Uh, we even put the Corvette backing plates and e-brake uh, cable bracket on here so we can do a parking brake off these. All the IRXs, you want a rear sway bar, they need that. So Brian and his wife, they do a lot of off-road racing. They are used to a live rear axle. They're used to a four-link. They know how to adjust anti-squat. They know how to adjust roll center. And they've worked with Curry for a long time. So this is what they're accustomed to and this is what they're comfortable with. And I'll tell you right now, Brian's gonna be able to drive this one for sure. This rear end has this giant end on it, right? So what that is, is it's got a really big heavy-duty unit bearing on it. So we refer to these as a floater because the axle can float. It doesn't have a traditional axle flange on it that the wheel mounts to. That can cause what's called pad knockback because it flexes and pushes the, the brake pads. So with the big giant unit bearing, the whole weight of the vehicle is on a giant heavy duty bearing and then the brakes mount to that axle housing. We'll uh, finish up welding some stuff on this and we'll get the link bars in it and you guys will see kind of what that looks like. 
Another really neat feature that's on this truck, since this one's gonna be so hardcore race, it has um, the hydrolift system. So this is a electric over hydraulic pump. It pumps fluid to the bottom of the coilover um, to, to lift the truck up a couple inches to either get in the trailer, get on a lift, get into a parking garage or whatever. So race height is all the way down the ground. He could have a splitter, you have a diffuser. He could you know, have a, an aerodynamic advantage with still being able to lift the truck up to make it accessible to work on or get in a trailer. That's another big option. Both these things will have our battery boxes mounted to the frames. This one has like the ZG spindle that you've always seen. It's a standard pin style. Uh, um, spindle so it's got your traditional packable bearings inside of it this is a great spindle this is also a much lower cost spindle it's tried and true we actually even put bearing spacers that preload inside there to make this a super strong spindle it's nice and tall there's tons of camber gain and then this one's also got the flaming river rack that we've been using now for probably three or four years with zero issues it's a nice heavy duty rack that is great where this one changes it up a little bit is now No Limit has an option to run the Willwood Pro Aluminum Spindle that has, again, this sealed unit bearing. So it's a, a bearing and hub assembly that bolts on with three bolts. The reason why so many guys want this nowadays is they don't like to have to work around the length of the pin or the length of the hub. You know, for wheel fitment, you either have to have a long center cap or you'd have to allow this to protrude through the wheel or even have a wheel that's just built to cover the, the, the spindle. These give you a lot more room. And the other thing that I really like about these spindles is that they've got a bolt-on steering arm. So you can machine the steering arm or fabricate a steering arm to place the tie rod wherever you want. So that allows you to adjust anchorman, it allows you to set um, bump steer, you know, to where there's none. And then a lot of these style spindles, you can use again that Corvette bearing to allow wheel speed. So you could do analog brakes with them. So that's why I like this so much. If we want to get right down to numbers, I think this is a $1,250 upgrade over the standard spindle. And the reason for that is they have to make the steering arm, uh, that includes the, the bearing, the spindle. And the other thing that I really like, which will be beneficial for a race truck, is a rebuildable and adjustable ball joint. Like if you guys go out and race, you're gonna beat the ball joint up in it, you know, maybe like every other season or so. The cool thing about these is that this top cap here is what tightens down onto the ball, so onto the stud itself. So you just pull the grease adjuster out and then you put a ratchet in here and you can snug it till there's zero lash, barely loosen it and tighten the locks again. So this is adjustable. You know, at the end of every season, you guys could pull this all apart, clean out the old nasty grease, readjust it, set the lash and, and re-grease it again. So these are a really good, they also call these low friction ball joints. So it's got those in the upper and lower. Those are a couple really neat options that they're adding to the chassis. Both these have big spline front sway bars so to keep the trucks nice and flat and cornering. And then I guess the last big uh, upgrade that this one got is a how rack. Again, this is a, a more hardcore race rack and pinion. This is made for racing. I mean, this has got valving profiles that can be changed. You can select what ratio you want. You can select which width you want. You can select how much, how much assist or how firm the feel is on the road course. So this has got uh, a pretty hardcore piece there. These probably add a couple thousand dollars over the standard racks that come these chassis. So anyways, those are the big differences in chassis. As you can see, we've got this one pretty much wrapped up. So now let's just kind of like jump in to see if we can get some stuff done on this one. I've got one of the coilovers installed uh, off camera on the front of the truck. And uh, I figured I'd show you real quick how, to, how we install these. So there may be a few more pieces or multiple springs here that maybe look uncommon to you. You traditionally would see maybe a coilover with one spring. We like to use a spring divider and then we use a, what they call a take up spring before, before it goes on. These are zero rate so that when it's on the car or when the car's on the ground, they completely collapse. But a lot of times when you want them really low, you'll have the preload adjuster set pretty low. And so if you put a, the car or the truck on the lift, it will uh, take all the tension off the spring. And then that one spring would be dingly dangling in here. So this take up spring just takes up that slack so that it's not flopping around. This setup here, I picked a thousand pound rate spring for, oh, you know what? I forgot another cool piece. These are Torrington bearings. So it's just a, a little flat bearing that allows the adjuster to turn easily underneath the main spring. There's also companies that sell little pieces of a little Delrin disc. 
you know, that'll isolate the spring too and keep it from digging in, make it easier to turn. But I picked a thousand pound rate for this one and that's uh, determined by motion ratio and weight of the vehicle. This truck's gonna be running an LT5, which is a heavier engine because it's got a blower on it. And then it's also got the cooling system from the supercharger, which is gonna add a, a chunk of weight too, because it's got a pump and a tank and a, and a cooler and all the water from that stuff. So if you got an all aluminum LS3 with a plastic intake, this whole combo may be another 250 pounds of weight on the front of the truck. So, and he wants to do a lot of road race. So we picked a pretty heavy duty spring. This also has a lot of stuff going on it, right? So you guys are familiar with like a one-way or a two-way adjustable coilover. Like a one-way adjustable would just be adjusting rebound. Um, JRIs have sometimes two-way where they can do a low speed and high speed rebound. There's also companies that sell a two-way that is rebound and compression control. This is a quad adjustable shock. So it has low and high speed control over both rebound and compression. So this is the uh, Mac Daddy, so to speak. So let's get this one tossed on. So I'm gonna try to spin this adjuster around so that he can get to the adjusters from the front side here. So a lot of times a little tricky when you got the upper control arm already in it. The cool thing about JRI is that when you order these, <clears throat> you tell them like what the width is between all your mounts. They'll turn you all the spacers. They'll machine all the spacers so that you don't have to do that stuff also. So like if you say, hey, my upper on the fronts has an inch and a quarter width, well, then they'll just take the and turn your little stainless, stainless spacers and uh, just put them right in. And then so the same thing when we ordered these lowers, we told them that the lower control arms were built with a trunnion mount. So it's that little like T bar that goes in the lower eyelet. You tell them how far the bolts are apart from each other. You tell them what size bolts you're using and. I mean, it's in the shock already when it comes. I mean, can't get easier than that. I have to get pry bar. So the other thing that we have to pay attention to is this is the supply line for that hydro lift. So when I ordered these, I already told them like what length that I want all these hoses. Even the, the reservoir hose, you can tell them if you want four feet on this reservoir hose or if you want 18 inches. That's kind of neat. Also, when you're putting them on, we always make sure that like this is going to be able to reach the spot that we wanted. So. It's, uh, it's pretty cool, it'll hit right where we want it to. So not only will we have the brake lines plumbed in this chassis, but we'll also have to run Dash 3 plumbing for all the hydraulic system too. So there's gonna be quite a bit of Dash 3 plumbing inside of it. I don't know if you guys have seen on our website, but we do sell all Dash 3 AN uh, braided soft lines for like stock chassis. Well, we actually just made soft line packages for these no limit chassis too. So we've already mocked up this entire chassis and uh, they're all getting crimped right now. So when these come back, I'll actually shoot a little bit of us installing all the soft lines in this and uh, you'll get to see how neat that is. Why we do that is that it's easier to seal um, than a traditional hard line. Like I'm gonna ship this across the country, right? So there's no way for me to test it really, really well. You know, I could actually hook the hydraulic system up and I could run it and make sure there's no leaks, but the brakes, I can't, I can't bleed all the brakes now to make sure that I don't have any leaks in my hard lines. So these soft lines are probably lighter. They're gonna be leak free absolutely leak free. I mean, there's no way that they're gonna leak and ship this thing and know that he won't have any issues. Honestly, it's just a more of a motorsport way to do things, I think. Better serviceability. Just figured I'd touch on that before I put the brakes on it. It's satisfying to hear that. One thing I've already got done is we've already torqued all the bolts for the hub and for the steering arm and everything. One thing that I would really recommend to you guys, especially if you're doing any kind of like track day stuff or autocrossing is buy a really good paint marker. Before an event, go to nut and bolt the, the vehicle. You can just visually inspect all your paint marks to make sure they're all still holding the torque that they're supposed to. 
And I guess I don't really need to tell you how to install wheel wood bricks. I'm sure you all have done it before or have read 10,000 articles on how it should be done. But a couple of things to like watch out for both radial spacing of the caliper and then spacing this way. A big thing that thing guys don't think about is how hot this disc gets and it and it'll grow. So like radial spacing is really important for for that. And then, you know, spacing this way and that. This is a fixed rotor. It cannot float, so you got to make sure that the the pad thickness and the distance on both sides is is the same when you install it. So that's why they give you all these cadmium plated thin washers. So when I'm mocking this stuff up now, again, I feel like I don't shouldn't be telling you all this stuff, but I guess I'm going to. Um, don't put Loctite on it or anything. Just do a dry mock up first so that you can uh, verify everything's perfect and then pull a bolt out at a time and put your Loctite on and then torque it to what they want you to torque it to. Yeah, that's one thing that I've noticed that you'll see uh, you and Dylan do most is that you'll go through and put a whole chassis together and then blow it. Make sure everything fits, you know, everything, you know, hole drill, whatever you got to do. Yeah. And then blow it all back apart and then powder, paint, final thing. Yeah. Will you remember when I put the rear brakes together on mud? Yeah. I did it like four times. Yes. Just trying to get the spacing perfect. But yeah, we like to do that. We like to make sure that everything is as exactly like you want it before you spend all your money and labor on uh, either painting your frame or powder coating your frame. Drill and tap every hole. Even if you're gonna like attach wiring to the frame, make your spot where you're gonna zip tie it or bolt it down so you don't have to do that after the powder coat. Well, shoot, that one didn't even start. I'm gonna have to ask for this just a little bit. Huh. The uh, bowl spacing on this is a little tight. It's really my dad that, that taught me that. He would always say, let me study it a minute. Just look, try to figure out what's going on. Oh, look, Jesse, look right here. I know, I just said Oh, okay, I just you did it, it. okay. Mm -hmm. I was like, that thing pulled off over here on the... See my microphone get stuck? Yeah, a little bag. <laughs> Well, I'm getting these pins out. Gives me an opportunity to tell you a little bit about brake pads. Um, a lot of these normal brake kits that you guys buy for your pickup trucks, look and see what brake pad they come with. Um, there is part numbers on them, but Willwood refers to them by numbers like BP10, BP20, BP30. These are BP20s. The friction coefficient versus temperature goes up. So when the temperature goes up, these bite harder than like a BP10. Like the BP10s are great for street. You've got more friction coefficient at a lower operating temperature. So like if you just went out here and went to the stop sign, they're gonna work pretty good. Like these BP20s, you'll have to warm them up a little bit. But when you get these things hot, they bite. And then obviously like a BP30, um, that carries on the scale even further. So the hotter they get, the, it, the friction coefficient doesn't drop. They just keep, they just keep operating hard. Um, so like if you had a 4,000 pound truck and you did a lot of road course stuff, you may put BP30s on the front. Um, I did that on my yellow and white truck. I kind of played with it a little bit. I ran BP20s in the back and BP30s in the front. So the friction coefficient wasn't as much in the back as it was in the front. So it could kind of give me a more front end bite. Again, I told you I wasn't going to talk to you a bunch about brakes, but I am. <laughs> you can't help it. Mm -mm. <coughs> no tapiru. So the instructions said to start out with two shims in there, so I did that. And I'm just going to start out with a, a single shim on the stud to see how the radial spacing is. Thank you. 
and always tighten these suckers down. Don't just let it sit there to check it. Tighten them down. I'll tell you right now, it looks like I need one more spacer to pull it back. But I'm gonna tighten it up just in case. This is the first time I've ever seen a, a white caliper. <laughs> is it, remind me, is it going on a white truck? So this truck is a 77 yellow and white square body. So <laughs> it's pretty cool because, um, like I'll just go ahead and say this, when I first saw Brian building this truck, I was like, what a douche. <laughs> <laughs> He's copying my truck. That's right. And here I am helping him. <laughs> yeah, it all comes around, man. But uh, no, I, I really like that I don't know if my truck had any type of inspiration on what he's doing but he's building a truck that has some some similarities but it is a completely different truck man it is it, it has a lot of cool pieces and a lot more attention to detail than my truck even had well that LT5 already just has my interest anyway just yeah so if you guys don't follow Brian it's Brian Crofts and then AZ Rod Shop is the other shop that's doing the full build. So they've got that truck in like final prime and uh, they're gonna be painting body in it and everything. So yeah, you guys should check it out. It's a pretty pretty fun one to watch. Radial clearance is, is really good. There's a ton of radial clearance. I'm gonna put one more shim to push it that way and then I'm gonna go ahead and lock tight it all. We got the front brakes all wrapped up. I'm gonna pick up my tools and we're gonna move on to putting the front spline sway bar on, which is a, also a big daddy. So now that the front brakes are on, I'm gonna toss the front sway bar in. And you guys have probably seen us use these a bunch. These are spline front sway bars. The reason we like these so much is because it's easy to change the rate of the bar. So this one is a 1.62. They're usually stamped on the end, a 1.62. So what that means is, they're an inch and three quarter bar. That's that's how that's the end of them, and then you can get them turned down to whatever thickness you want in the middle of them. Um, so there's actually a chart that'll help you convert the rate of this bar. So a 1.62 bar. Um, let's say it's got a 12 inch arm, like it might be a 1,200 pound rate. But if you drop it to a nine inch bar like this, like it might you know, it might drop it by, what is that, like 400 pounds or something. So imagine if you, well, if you exaggerate, it, it, say you had a three foot arm on this, it would drop the rate a lot. You might make it a 500 pound rate bar. So this is a 1.62 with like a nine and a half inch arm. I don't remember what it is. Let's just say it's like right under 1400 pound rate. Don't buy this unless you're gonna run a bunch of front tire and have a lot of grip in the front end. If you're just gonna drive around on the street, this much bar rate would under, like cause the front tires to push. It'd be a lot of understeer. So we kind of play with a balance on how much bar rate we want. Obviously spring rate's a thing to consider too, but um, you just gotta be careful with how much bar you run. He's gonna do a lot of road race, so high speed, high G on a real sticky tire. That's when you get up to a bar like this. So if the truck did push too much with his tire and alignment specs, we could drop down to like a 1.56, this is right below this. So it might drop it a couple hundred pounds of rate. So that's why we like these so much is we can literally just buy another one of these, slide it out of the frame and slide a new one in and make a pretty quick change. So NASCAR you know, ran these, they're 37 and a half inches long. This is what has been in NASCAR forever. And then Cup Series, all this, um, all the Craftsman Series trucks, they all ran this bar. So that's why we run them, because they're NASCAR. The thing that's important is when you spline the opposing end on, since there's 48 splines, just make sure you're not a spline off in either direction. It'll make your end links a nightmare to get back, back on. And these do have a groove machined into the spline, so that, that uh, 7 16 bolt only goes in one spot. Turn these 
guys up. In my truck, I didn't have an inner fender, so you know it, it would have been fine to mount it. You know, on the outside of the frame, I could just reach down and hit it. Yeah. But I think he's going to have full inner fenders, so we may not even mount these. We may hold on so that they can get everything else in here. Excuse me, before they mount these. Yeah, because he's going to have an electric water pump for the supercharger, plumbing, and all that stuff. Supercharger hoses and stuff coming through here too, and an inner fender. I don't want to go making them have to move this. So we'll let that sucker just dangle, and I'm going to. I'm gonna work on the rear end. Let's do it. Oh, Jesus. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. What we got going on here? So we're about to weld or at least tack on all the coilover lower brackets and the four link upper and lower bar brackets. Why we're having to do this is because this isn't a rear end that came from No Limit. So No Limit didn't have this whenever they built the chassis. So they were nice enough to at least send us all the bracketry that they use. Um, so again, this is the one that Curry built for us. And when Brian was doing the ordering process, I was able to tell him what what to convey to them for wheel mount surface to wheel mount surface width. So we're targeting with the brakes on a specific width and so they were able to build this floater in to those dimensions for us and excuse me they shipped it directly to us so now we just got to go back in and weld all this stuff on so uh, Dylan and I spent a little bit of time just DA and then getting this stuff really clean and uh, we're going to lay out the marks of where they go and then we need to set the angle so that is key you know you don't want to go in and get the pinion angle just right and then all of a sudden the coilover is, is hitting the, the bracket or something so it was easy enough for me to just uh, call Rob and Rob told me that these need to be two degrees from third member mount face and the face of the link brackets to be zero degrees or parallel to this. So once it's in there and pinion it up, there's plenty of room for the uh, coil over to not get in, get in touch with these. So width wise, all we're gonna do now is we're gonna go take the width measurement from the frame of where the chassis end of the four link bars mount. So that'll give us a frame of reference. We can measure the total width of this, and then we have this little center line tool. It's a little tool that you can buy that snaps on the studs for a nine inch, and it has like little cuts made in it, so you can hook your tape measure to it and measure from center line out. Why that's important is you wouldn't want to assume that middle is middle of this, because it's not. We have all these rear ends built with a half inch of offset built into them. What that means is, is say the transmission is dead centered, the pinion is going to be offset by just a half inch. And we do that just to make the U-joints live a lot longer. So when we lay these out and make our measurements, um, you've got to accommodate for that half inch offset. So this is pretty straightforward. Outside of the, the chassis in bracket to outside is 42 inches. And then we already know that the width inside here is inch and three quarter and the wind's the width in those is inch and three and inch and three quarter. So we can literally target 42 inch width on that. So we'll go lay those out now. <laughs> all right, so 58 inch overall. And then here you guys are gonna notice right away that these are gonna be different. Yeah, this one. 28.5. And 29.5. So they're one inch different from each other, meaning that center is a half inch off. So if you guys are good at math, and we need to be 42, what do they need to be, right? Okay, 42 total would be 20 and a half and, 20. and, and 21 and a half. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that gives us our half inch offset. So this is the long side. So I should be able to transfer my 21 and a half on this side, 20 and a half. So we cut it's the- Sunday morning. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, uh, we cut the camera off because uh, I thought I was mathing wrong and it's not, I'm just, I'm just looking wrong. <laughs> I marked 22 and a half, son of a gun. And I should have marked 21 and a half. So my bad. So now these should be the same. They should be eight inches on both sides. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're great now. Sorry, folks. So we got our mark, and so the face of this from Rob at No Limit needs to be parallel with where the third member mounts. I'm just gonna get
get my torch ready so that when I get it to zero, I put a little tacky do on there. So now that I got small tacks on all four corners, I'll just re-verify. We are zeros. And I'm gonna put a couple healthier ones on it. So these are both tacked on and at zero, yeah, 21 and a half. And that would have been 20 and a half. So I'm gonna put a couple healthier tacks on these and then we'll put the shock brackets on and we'll put it underneath the truck for when we tack the panhard bar bracket on. So I got all four link bars matched up to the same length. You guys can do this at home, it's kind of cool. You just, all I do is literally stack them so that make sure they line up. Make sure you ain't got one bar that's like two turns off or something. Um, so ultimately this truck's gonna get uh, billet link bars and he's gonna do, uh, I think it's all FK rod ends. He's sponsored by FK. Um, so FK and him are gonna do a little collaboration where they do billet arms with his ends. So we're gonna put these in so that at least when he gets it out there, he knows what length to make the make the four link bars. This is um, something that we've come up with, with with no limit over the past couple years and it's using the Ride Tech R joint. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with these R joints, but they are, kind of a cross between a Johnny joint and a Heim joint. It's pretty neat, they've got Delrin inserts in them, or I don't even think it's Del Delrin, it's some type of self-lubricating plastic, and it's got a, a, a spring washer or a wave washer. So as these rotate and wear, like a normal rod in, once it gets some play in it, you'd have to replace it. These, they just keep, I guess this side has a, a taper to it. So as these wear, the spring washer pushes and just kind of keeps reapplying tension and taking up any kind of backlash in this. Um, so these are, from what they say, they have never replaced one of these. And these are cast, I think, or forged from 321 stainless or something. I don't know all the specs, but these are supposedly really, really strong. The reason why we've been using these is that earlier on, No Limit was putting a urethane end on this end and a urethane end on this end. Well, when the truck tries to body roll and both tires are on the ground, um, one end needs to be able to rotate. So that's why we've switched to this. It is. Yep. So I'm gonna hop to the other side and make sure that I get both uppers in first. That way we can swing the lower up in place. The upper, you, you, you can't swing it down because of the bracket, so you gotta be careful. Cool. 
I've had a lot of people ask me what holes they need to have their link bars in, and that, that's up to you and that's up to your setup. The, what you're gonna be adjusting with these is how much forward bite and how much traction the truck has. It's called anti-squat. We want as much separation at the back as we can get. I think these are about 11 inches, but it's gonna come down to the fact of ride height. The lower bar in a four link, you want to be not quite parallel with the ground, but you want the front to just be a hair higher. So if you get that, then you, you want to set this one to where you have as much traction as that you like. Um, if the truck seems to bite plenty in the top hole and, and, and accelerate forward, leave it here. If you feel like you're, you don't have as much traction as you need, drop it down one and that'll bump the anti-squat number a ton and it'll give you a lot more forward bite. The balance is, is if you move it down here and it tries to wheel hop or feel like it's gonna break something, you, you've got too much anti-squat number and you're gonna have to come back up. So that's how you know. I don't have all the spacers here or spacers machine that I need, so at least we'll just be able to toss it in here and hang it and, uh, I don't know, feel a sense of accomplishment. But what I want to do too is hang this thing and we'll, next time we'll center the rear end and we'll uh, shoot a little video of us putting the Panhard bar mount on. just like that. And then uh, we'll probably mount our little reservoirs back here. And he can just reach underneath the truck and adjust. I really like that. Me too. Yeah. We toss the other side on. Like I said, there's a, a big spacer that goes on this 5 8 bolt back here that'll hold the coilover out. But that's that. Super pumped on how this, how these turned out. That'd be cool. it up for our weekend with Robbie. Appreciate you guys watching. Um, there was a good amount of information here that I'm really happy that you guys got to digest. I feel pretty accomplished. We got the four link bar brackets attached. We got the coilover brackets attached. Some of the brakes mocked up, coilovers on it. Seems pretty good. Over the next few days, Dylan and I will get the Panhard bar done. We'll machine all the spacers, get the springs on, get a lot of plumbing on. If you guys have any questions about chassis stuff uh, or shock stuff or any of the stuff that we went over in this video, put a comment in the bottom or if you want a real technical help, shoot an email to sales at level7motorsports.com, the word spelled out. So anyways, hope you guys enjoyed this. We'll see you on the next one.